Welcome to today's venture capital panel discussion brought to you by Bamboo and Michigan Central. Um, we're very excited to have you here. So giving folks just a minute to join us. Um, jump in the chat, say hello, uh, tell us where you're tuning in from. And we're gonna go ahead and kick off a poll to get a pulse of who's in the room with us today. So if you all could jump in, tell us if you're fundraising, considering fundraising an investor or a community member to help the audience, help us know who's in the audience today. And for those who don't know Bamboo, we are dedicated to building an inclusive startup community. So we're a network and a community of spaces here in Michigan. Um, and we've partnered with Ford to help grow our mobility ecosystem. We've got some fantastic founders and venture capitalists on the call today. We're gonna go ahead and close that poll in just a few seconds. And I'm gonna introduce today's moderator, James Courtney, who leads external engagement with Michigan Central at Ford Motor Company. James is an urban planner by training and marketer by trade. He's very passionate about urbanism, economics, and human behavior. And in his current role with Ford, he's supporting the community efforts to bring to life an innovation mobility district here in Detroit. So James, welcome. I'm gonna hand it over to you to introduce all of our speakers today. And unmute please, James. <laughs> Of course I'm on mute. How can we not start that? Start without one of those. But thank you, Amanda. Uh, thanks for the intro. Um, and I know we have a lot of good questions and a really great panel. So what I'm going to do is uh, invite each one of our panelists to join us and, and give a little bit of an intro. And first, I'd like to uh, start off with uh, Camille. If you would just kind of come join on, on camera and introduce yourself and a little bit about your company. Sure. Thanks so much, James. Well, good morning. Well, it's morning here in Los Angeles, but a good afternoon to everyone else. Uh, my name is Camille Christina Terry. I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Charger Help. So at Charger Help, we are getting people in electric vehicle charging stations back to work. I decided to launch this little company in January of 2020, right before COVID and everything else that came with 2020. Uh, but I'm excited to say that today we have 32 full-time employees across eight states, and we recently closed out our seed round earlier this year. So I am um, thrilled to be here with y'all and to share about my journey um, and to encourage all of y'all to, to go get it, you know, and we can do it together. Thanks, James. Thanks. Thanks, Nina. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Carolyn to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Carolyn Mooney. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Next Move. Uh, sorry, I'm based in Philadelphia, so it's afternoon for me, Camille. Um, but uh, we are basically in the business of making better decisions faster for companies. Uh, so we give developers a toolkit to optimize and automate uh, their operations, whether it's, you know, a dispatch algorithm or a workforce scheduling algorithm, anything like that, uh, we feel like your engineers should have access to the tools to create that really easily and to ship it to production. So um, my background is a little bit in the logistics space. So I spent a bunch of time building out a team to work on all things automated fulfillment at Grubhub uh, with my co-founder. And uh, before that was a small meal delivery startup here in Philly. And so we finished raising our Series A back in December. Uh, similar to Camille, we also were kind of like a COVID, COVID startup. Uh, we did Y Combinator uh, right around the time that COVID was kicking off uh, in winter 2020. And uh, we raised our seed round right after that. And then we raised our Series A about six months later. So uh, super excited to be here and to learn more about what everyone is uh, interested enough to. Thanks. That one, I mean, I think from both of you to just kind of hear how quickly you kind of got going is really, really inspiring. Um, and, and last, I'd like to ask uh, Santosh if you wanted to join and give, give a little back, bit of background and introduce yourself, please. Sure. Uh, great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity um, to, to kind of share and learn. But I'm Santosh. I'm a partner here at Dynamo Ventures. 
and at Dynamo Ventures, uh, myself and the rest of the team, we're focused on uh, investing and supporting pre-seed and seed stage startups in supply chain and mobility. Um, and one of those startups we have the good fortune of working with uh, is Nextmove and um, working with both Carol and Ryan, as well as the broader team as they look to uh, make an impact and change the industry from their vantage point. Well, thanks. I, actually, as we jump into questions, I think I'm gonna keep it with you, uh, Santosh. Um, if you wouldn't mind just kind of giving the audience, I know myself, I'm not an expert, maybe just kind of take us through like, what are the different ways to, to fund startups? Like, how do you how do you get connected? How do you actually, you have this idea, you're ready to go, you're ready to scale and you need that next step. How do you start to um, find the path that you need to take to move forward? Sure. So yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start it with, and it might be a, a bit unusual, but uh, most businesses don't need VC. Venture capital is a very specific type of capital that is suitable for to a subset or for a subset of businesses. So when entrepreneurs are stepping back and saying, I want to build something or I'm in the middle of building something and I need some capital, they should kind of take a look at the entire spectrum, right? And uh, I think everybody could probably agree that revenue, your customer's dollar is the best dollar you could have. And funny enough, your customer dollar unlocks all the other dollars uh, available to you oftentimes, whether it's venture capital, bank financing, friends and family or angel. So to be aware of that. And really when you consider venture capital, uh, you should try to find folks uh, within your network or, or I would say kind of your, your, your sphere of influence, perhaps. And the reason I say not kind of in your agencies, some people may not have that, uh, but they might know a friend of a friend who is a VC and can give them some perspective. But really the things you're looking for as you are considering raising venture capital is that it's dilutive, right? Uh, in a seed series A, you're probably giving up 20 to 25% of your company. Um, there is an expectation that you're growing or you plan to grow at a certain rate. You have this ambition and need to get to a certain shape and size to deliver a return for a VC. Uh, but equally, there might also be certain aspects of your business that requires the capital, right? So something uh, around electrification, right? There's a lot of R&D that is required before one can even commercialize it. Robotics, autonomous vehicles, a lot of deep computational technology could also fall in that realm. Uh, but I kind of, I'll bring it all together and encapsulate and say like, think, th think hard about it. It's not just VC, great businesses get built without VC. But if you do think VC is a fit, kind of think through those points as to is my ambition, is what I'm building going to be a fit? Uh, if not, you might unnecessarily feel discouraged uh, by VCs who say, hey, this isn't for us. When in fact, you're probably onto something awesome. Yeah, no, that's really um, eye opening. I mean, I'm not an entrepreneur in that in that sense, but it seems there are many ways at funding, and looking at one only is not not a not necessarily the best um, way to go. So, with that, I have a question for the founders, and I would like the and kind of piggybacks, and I like to ask Camille first. Um, could you just kind of tell a little bit about your personal journey on raising capital and and you know? when did you start to decide to actually take it investment from others and like how that played out into your business? Yeah, thanks James for the question. Um, I guess to start out just a, a little bit of background of, about me. So I used to work for a software company called EV Connect. And at that company, we built software for EV charging stations. Um, it was a startup at the time. So I had the really neat opportunity to grow with them. And so I used to be the person that would answer all of the driver tickets. So every time a driver was, you know, excited or maybe not so excited about their experience, I was the great person that, you know, helped them not tear up our stations because they were frustrated. So um, over time, I had the really cool opportunity to grow with that company. So, you know, I had the opportunity to stand up their customer experience department and network operations center. In my last role, I was actually in charge of deploying EV charging stations all over the United States under like the Electrify America and Southern California Edison, um, and then also standing up the DC fast charger infrastructure in Australia. 
So I say all of that to say that one of the issues that we had when I was in that position was that it was really, really hard to find people to fix our stations because we found that 80% of our issues were non-electrical. And so we would hire electrical contractors, but because it isn't, you know, they're still charging us a lot, but in, in the grand scheme of things, they make way more money in installing stations than trying to go out to our little stations and, and troubleshoot with us on the spot. Um, and so I saw that there was a huge need. Um, and so I left the company actually to take care of my mom. And I actually started volunteering just to get people out into the field to fix charging stations but then I couldn't get those people hired. And so then that's when I went to those folks, you know, that I wanted to connect these people with and who ended up being my customers. And I said, hey, if I had a company, you know, and I hired the people and then you hired me to fix the stations, would you do that? And they said, yeah, if you had a company, Camille, we know you, you know, we would do that. And so then we launched in January of 2020. And so for me, it was that I had to scale quickly. Right. I, I couldn't be a mom and pop shop for, for long enough in order to have contracts with ABBs and the tritiums of the world. Um, and so that's when I decided to take on infrastructure dollars. The other thing is I knew that that the need within my industry was so real and so pertinent, not to just EV adoption, but to, to the current infrastructure. Right. Because without the stations properly communicating, if you're in LA, they used to have these things called um, rolling blackouts when we all turn on our ECs, right? Or even what happened in Texas. So it was really mission critical. Um, and so when I went out to raise, you know, that's the story that I went with. It's that not only, you know, is this a real issue for today, but, but I am the best person and this is the best company in order to accomplish, you know, you know, the thing that needs to be said. And I think that that's why we were able to raise capital at the rate that we were. And because it was a, a good alignment to, to Santaja's point, it was that we had to scale quickly. There was no other way to address the need that we were seeing across the US without a scaling quickly. That is one, I, um, the, you just kind of tell the story of you selling yourself, not just the idea, I think is, is great and something that as you know people should really uh stick to and also the access you're creating for employment is really important important and tying that to your business um carolyn i wonder if you might want to join and uh give a little bit of your story on, on how you get things moving sure definitely uh, so we actually have like, we're uh, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of like costs and stuff like that, because we actually aren't, aren't, aren't as heavy in the operation side. Um, so it's kind of an interesting perspective to kind of flip that around and say for a software company, like, why would you, uh, why would you want to go take investment? And what I'll say is that when we, when Ryan and I, my co-founder and I originally started the company, we didn't think we were going to go the VC route. <laughs> I don't even know if Sandash has heard this story. So, uh, but we really didn't think we were going to go the VC route. We spent about three years building out, um, you know, all things fulfillment at Grubhub. Uh, so everything from like automated dispatch, forecasting and scheduling, ETA generation, market management in real time, basically the uberification of <laughs> like the, the Grubhub uh, fulfillment side of the house. And so when we kind of started, we said, hey, like, we're, we're good for a little while. Let's see if we can get this off the ground. Let's see if we can bootstrap. Um, and we had a, a few founder friends and they said like, yeah, you, you know, you can try to start getting a couple of customers and then kind of like see how that goes and, and just kind of build it slowly. And uh, I, I would say like we, we started the company in July 2019. And then like in that fall time frame, we just realized that there was a really big need, not just for our original product, which was around uh, simulation, so how to basically test new algorithms, which is where we kind of started our focus. Uh, but as we started building out our uh, our application for Y Combinator, which actually was a founder friend of ours just said, hey, fill out this application. It'll help you frame uh, your story to, to venture capitalists if you want to go that route. And if not, it just gives you a really good business plan. We said, great, okay, like we'll use this as kind of a way to formulate some of our answers. And as we started filling it out, we started realizing some things um, about our business. And one was that we were kind of going after the wrong target user. Uh, so when we originally kicked off the company, we were thinking we were gonna sell to data scientists. Uh, that's kind of who we worked with and who we identified with um, you know, at, at Grubhub. But we realized that there was a broader application here, which is 
a lot of data science platforms had started this transition to being accessible by developers. And by being accessible for developers, you open up the market category and really create a new category of, of users for yourself and also a new category of software uh, really in the market. And so uh, once we started realizing that we won, <laughs> we actually, since we had already filled out that application for Y Combinator, we ended up submitting it. Uh, and didn't think we were going to get in. And then we got an, an interview and we ended up getting an, an offer to go uh, join their winter 20 batch. And we kind of sat down and said, okay, well, if we're going after developers, uh, you know, Y Combinator couldn't be a better place to get some of that recognition for developer brand, right? And so, uh, you know, getting the brand recognition, also the fact that almost every Y Combinator startup that we talked to could have been a potential user originally. So, uh, not necessarily for routing, but for other decisions, automated decisions around optimization and simulation. And so uh, we kind of started kind of stacking that together. We had an interesting uh, aspect of being first time founders. So uh, at the same time we were doing the Y Combinator thing, we actually had a few angel investors that were just in our network, uh, kind of like a friends and family around uh, that kind of came together at the same time. And we ended up taking both. Uh, so Sandosh kind of talked about the, the dilution perspective, like uh, we went a little bit heavier on that initially, uh, but it really was, I think, good for us because the brand recognition that we got, uh, and this kind of gets into the why, why or why not to do an accelerator, but the brand recognition for us was, was really important uh, for doing Y Combinator, and it helped us really gain customer, uh, you know, backing, I guess, like, or like, you know, confidence in our, in our solution and also the, like our technology. Uh, so that was really interesting. And then we ended up raising our seed round right after Y Combinator, which is when Santosh and our other uh, co-lead investor from Firstmark, Matt Turk came in. And really this whole time, uh, I would say we, we really thought about investment in this space, really giving us, giving us the necessary resources from our own team perspective to go scale this technology, right? Like we have to build a self-serve pipeline, uh, you know, similar to like the elastic stripe and like Twilio's of the world, right? We have to, you know, build out uh, features that are really easy to use and really easy to scale. And so there's a lot of like core technology and, uh, you know, self-serve community pipeline that we really needed to, to, you know, drive with investment. And, and so ultimately, I would say we weren't really in that mode originally, but like that, that's just that kind of that learning curve happened over that, you know, six to eight month period where we were like, okay, yeah, we really do need to, to get the investment to, to scale quickly here. So it sounds like the, you know, Camille and Carolyn had kind of different approaches, different stories a bit, but I want the one thing that stuck out to me was, was your network, um, different networks, but that was a, a reliance on one for sound like Camille customers and you with, with some of the um, the investors. So that's really, really interesting. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, Santosh and ask, um, so typically when you, when you, you know, are looking for companies, what stage are you kind of focused on when, when you look to invest in something? And, so and where, how, how do you make that decision on who or what? Sure. So, so we're what you would categorize as pre-seed or seed stage investors, right? So um, I would say about half the time we're the first like professional investor to come in. You'll probably raise maybe friends and family, maybe not. Uh, you might have bootstrapped uh, and we'll come in, in in that juncture. Equally about half of our investments are revenue generating businesses. So what you would call seed stage businesses. So we tend to split our uh, portfolio about half and half, uh, roughly, but a lot of the same kind of motions when you think about both stages of investment. And I think any pre-seed, seed, and even series A investor would tell you that the majority of your decision comes down to the team, right? And, uh, like we are, we're kind of manic about ensuring that we have conviction in the team and we have outlined 10 different qualities that we will go collect anecdotes, data, references in and around prior to making a commitment um, to supporting a team, right? And notice the word I say, a team. And what we've seen is that great teams can navigate anything a market brings them. So our general attitude is we'll take a great team in a very average market because they'll likely persevere and be a winner. 
Whereas equally, there are teams that may not have the right complements. They may not be thinking maybe in a data informed way. Uh, there might be uh, kind of issues around how tenacious that team might be together. And you could bring them a great market, but even great markets wax and wane, right? There are obstacles, there are challenges. Building big businesses is not easy. Like if, if you want to get wealthy, like there are much easier ways one could go about it, but it's a very fulfilling thing to be an entrepreneur and being able to have a vision, seeing impact through your eyes. There's just something that I don't think can be matched. And equally as seed investors, we try to align to that. So we have a saying that 80% of our decision rests on the team. But then as you look at the remaining 20%, it'll fall on market. And market is just not what is a large market, but is this a burning problem? What are the structures in market that one needs to navigate in order to effectively sell through, right? And what would you price it at? Does that business model make sense ultimately for a fund that might be looking for businesses closer to a billion dollars in return, right? And that metric, by the way, for folks listening, don't take that as... Uh, oh, this is uh, kind of the thing we need. Different funds will have different thresholds of, of exit value. It's very much driven by their fund size. And then I would say the last thing, and this is more for seed stage companies, traction. What have they done? Have they proved that they could do a lot with a little is what I oftentimes call it. And that really speaks to resourcefulness, the chops on the team. So it almost comes full circle, if you would. Um, yeah. And a lot of Series A investors would, would tell you the same in terms of how they uh, make decisions and filter through. So, um, you, I mean, I think you, you answered it already without me asking it, but I'm going to ask anyway, and maybe you can go a little bit deeper. In your eyes, what really makes an ideal entrepreneur part of that team? I assume that's the, the, the core person to that team that you, you put 80% of your decision making into. So I, I use the word team because I think it's very hard to be a solo founder. Um, solo founders are few and far between. That's not to say that we haven't funded some, we have funded a couple of them. But in that sense, we look for the ability, the, the, the demonstrated ability to attract compliments, right? And then it also comes down to, are they self-aware? What does a compliment for them look like? Because most startups open up with, people sitting in a room and usually on one side you have people who build stuff and the other side, you probably only have one person who wants to sell stuff, right? You don't need a big sales team in, in the early days. It's usually the CEO too, who's doing the selling at that point, but having kind of those compliments, because there's a lot that goes into that, right? You have somebody who's visionary out in front running, moving fast, but then you have a lot of the, the, the pragmatic personality as to that's great, but how do we deliver and how do we actually do? So you tend to see that you have this really interesting CEO, CTO, or business leader, technical leader dynamic that's really powerful. So we try to lean into that, but along with that, are they coachable, right? Do they have an advantage insight or have they spent time in industry that's gonna give them that edge, that aha, oh yeah, this is what people are missing. Um, are they engaging? And this is especially important for the CEO, right? CEO's job is to engage people. You have to engage your employees, you have to engage your investors, your customers, and each required context switching of sorts. And then again, self-awareness, like how do I make people feel when I get into the room? What does body language uh, look like? So these are some of the uh, qualities we look for, but they're ultimately 10. And at Dynamo, you have to check off all 10. Uh, before getting an investment. No, that's great. It sounds like you're, you know, looking for a spouse in many ways. Um, <laughs> you should think of it like a marriage, yeah. right? Like I, I, I joke, like you can't get rid of me. Um, <laughs> even if you're successful, like, yeah, we both shared in, in, in success, right? You did the hard work as the entrepreneur. Like, let's be real, Camille, Carolyn, do the hard work. As an investor, I just have the good fortune that I was invited along for the ride. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and, and I mean, it, it just, it makes sense. Um, to switch back to the, uh, to Camille and Carolyn, um, I don't know, I guess we can start with, with Carolyn this time. Um, and I think I might know the answer already because you already said it, but how did you find your, your, your first in, investor? And I don't know if this follow-up to that is in, is, 
it's an odd question to ask, but um, what makes an ideal investor in your mind? No, I was, I, was, I was chuckling here on the side because I feel like uh, I, I feel like our, our relationship is on display, so Tosh, uh, here with like uh, just like that process and stuff. But it's kind of cool to see like both sides and just I think some of some of the story and background like we actually didn't have uh, even before this. So uh, it's kind of cool to go back and forth. But yeah, our first our first investor was actually a the founder of uh, the company that we were that Ryan, my co-founder, and myself worked for actually um so similar to camille like kind of like they knew the space right and so they knew that routing was like really hard building algorithms into your business for an operations business was really hard how do you enable uh your operations with automation um, in your software and so they were really into that vision and actually we got uh all of that c exec c exec team to invest in us as um as part of the angel round so that was our first investor um uh, and then our our second two, which were our, um, uh, we had one uh, smaller VC firm uh, called 2048 uh, that invested in us. And we kind of found them, I found them through basically like what I call like network gymnastics. Like I was just talking to a variety of people doing cartwheels all over the place, trying to figure out, uh, you know, who was interested in this space, like even what was out there or how they thought about investment in this space. And one really interesting thing for us, um, is that uh, initial investor, Alex Iskold at 2048, was the one that actually introduced us to Dynamo. So that's actually how we met uh, at Santosh. So uh, that's like something to be said too. Like like once you kind of understand, uh, you have some people that kind of really, uh, your your story your story resonates, right? So that's kind of what, what Santosh was talking about. Um, and then also they are fit for you. Uh, so something I think is maybe not talked about often enough is that it's a, it's a two-way relationship. It's not a one-way relationship. So it wasn't just that uh, that we needed investment and we were, we had to check the boxes for for Dynamo, but like but Dynamo had to check the boxes for us too, right? And so um, with them specifically, like we were looking at, hey, like we want partners that are experts in the logistics space broader than just uh, meal delivery, where we had spent some time and, and focus and effort. And we also wanted people that had been operators. Actually, I think I think every single one of our VCs. I re recently, uh, you know, did, did another talk. I think every single one of our VCs was, has been an operator before, meaning they have run a startup or been involved in like in an early stage startup at some point. That's really powerful uh, because they've just like lived some of the problems that and challenges that you're going to face, and you know, have some thoughts and opinions uh, about e either some things you should think about, some people you should talk to. Or maybe some approaches that you shouldn't do, <laughs> uh, and those are all like really, really helpful things. And uh, we really thought about, hey, like, hey, uh, when we when we go out for investment, uh, everyone on that team should be our strategy team. And so, where were we deficient uh, in our understanding, and how could we build our uh, venture team around us to to fill out like that strategy team uh, and you know that's how we thought about it and for two technical founders I thought that was a like, critical uh, I had no experience in sales I had no experience in marketing I had no experience in operating a, a company I knew how to run a team uh, because we had run a, a pretty big team at, at Grubhub but I didn't have a lot of like you know kind of some of the extracurriculars there so uh, we really thought about, hey, how do we bring on operators? How do we bring on people that are, you know, familiar in the technology space, in the logistics space, in some spaces around, you know, sales, marketing, customer success, all those things uh, to to fill it out. So uh, that's kind of how we thought about that process. And and Camille, um, what about you? How did you uh, find your first uh, investor, and and what is that ideal kind of relationship look like? Yeah, I think one thing to highlight is like for us, the first batch of money that we got was actually through pitch competitions and like grants. So I raised a little bit under half a million dollars from doing that. And so as soon as we decided to, to do the company, I registered for every pitch competition that had money attached to it that was possible. And what that did for me was that it helped me just like get my story together. Um, I think the interesting part probably with both of Caroline and I company is that if you're not an expert within our field, then you don't really understand the problem, right? And so I had to learn to, to, to get my investors to understand that this is like a problem that's happening that 
we're solving for that our industry doesn't talk about because they want EV adoption, right? So I had to learn how to like, how do I craft my story in a way that gets people engaged and believes that I'm the person that can solve it. Um, so I, I throw that out to folks because like a lot of times you don't necessarily want to go to a VC first, right? And you want to figure out ways to get your story together, get your product together, right? And that people understand it, that it makes sense. So I did that. So we did about $400,000 with grants and pitch competitions. And then um, to Caroline's point, I think you kind of hit on it a little bit, was finding um, an incubator or finding an accelerator. So we're a part of the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator and also a part of Elemental's Accelerator. And those two things are very helpful for entrepreneurs because that way I had, didn't have to do any cold calls, right? So then everything was a warm introduction. I know that's something within the VC world they're trying to steer, stay away from, but like the reality is people are more than likely gonna take a conversation with you if you were blessed by one of their friends. And that's just is what it is. Um, and so by having an incubator and accelerator, um, align us with the right investors, that's how we were able to find our investors. So our lead investor actually came to us from a, um, we had a, a, a demo day with Lacey and they heard us pitch um, and that's Trucks VC. And then they followed up and that was relationship building. Um, the last, and then to your other question, just like, how do we find a good VC? So for us as my, uh, my co-founder is also a black female. And so we started pitching at the height of George Floyd. And so what we ended up getting were what, you know, is a lot of VCs that we couldn't tell if they were just talking to us because we were two black female founders and that they were actually gonna write a check, right? Because at that time period, a lot of VCs were getting called out on not investing in black founders. So they, we were booking a lot of meetings, right? But a lot of times when we actually asked, oh, are you writing a check this year? They're like, no. Right. And so what we were looking for for VCs were number one, can you write a check this year? Do you have money left to, to give money? Because you have to really have that have that conversation up front. And then the second point for us, it wasn't about just dollars. It was like, can you introduce me to people that I don't know? Right. Can you tell, can you help me get to what my next milestone is going to be? What does your connections book look like? Right. Because I can go find money. I figure that out. I can go <laughs> write a grant and find money. But can you do the stuff that I can't do as a founder or that my team can't do? Um, and I think coming to the conversation of interviewing our VC, you know, also was very helpful. And do, do you understand my industry? When we get to due diligence, am I going to have to write a book for you about my industry? Because if that's the case, then like we just not gonna be good together. Uh, so just like really understanding number one, your value as a founder, really understanding, you know, what do you want from a VC? All money is not good money. You know, and then don't waste your time doing two months of due diligence because your VC doesn't understand your, your business. At that point, you know, you have no time to, as a as a as a founder to be sitting trying to explain every single thing. If somebody gets it, they're going to get it. And to Santosh's point, for seed investors, it's really about the team. You know, and so it's like either they believe in you as a as a team person and that you're going to be able to conquer this thing, or they don't. And if they don't, it's better to get that no faster than it is for you to be drugged along and you're wasting your time. Yeah, no, that's great, and you. I, I love, you know, all money's not good money. Like that's, I think we should all think about that in many different aspects of, of life. Um, to kind of follow up with that, I'm gonna, I was gonna ask this one a little later, but um, there's a growing notion that investment should be more than just providing capital. I mean, I think you've touched on that a little bit. If, Camille, if you agree with that, um, how have your investors kind of done more than just giving money? Um, and how do you like benefit from from additional like support and what is that yeah it's so crazy so it's so crazy because before we even started saying yes to me, so okay just a little quick backstory you know we went out to raise 1.5 million we soft circled eight million dollars investors so we had a lot of breakup calls uh, which was very sad because i made great relationships with all I, like all the investors i wanted them to be my friend but can't give up that much equity so you know we only took on 2.75 but during that time period of actually like choosing people we had investors that were making introductions from then and so i think like that's the cool part is for them to show their value beforehand and so some of the introductions like our next 
kind of like customer segment are fleets, right? So a lot of these fleets are electrifying. So like the Amazons of the world, right? And so we, we, so those are some of the introductions that we started receiving. And then the other part that's very helpful too is like PEO systems, like accounting, all of the random stuff that Carolyn and I has to do as CEOs over companies. So you're like, you don't get to do the cute stuff anymore after you raise money, you're like in the trenches. But they helped, you know, help us start figuring out some of those um, components of the business um, that maybe you aren't that well versed in and getting you connections that way. So definitely new customer segments that you want to enter into. And then just like the real like nitty gritty business stuff, like finding an office at a good price, um, getting good healthcare options, um, hiring, um, having them being able to contribute to all of those things are so important to the success of your company. So just, we've got about five more minutes. Just want to let the three of you know, before we get into like Q and A. So I did want to um, ask uh, both Carolyn and um, San Santosh, that same question, but obviously Santosh, from your perspective, um, you know, what are those things that, and you can go first and then Carolyn, what are those things that you, that uh, your firm approaches in terms of other than just funds and the seed? Yeah. Um, so I, I certainly think these days with the amount of venture capital out there, there's a lot of options. And I think the Camille's point, like just because there's money doesn't mean it's good money or money worth taking. And one can kind of go down the route of, is this a constructive investor, toxic investor, what have you. But the reality is there's only so much equity one should be giving up at any given round. And you want to optimize for that beyond just dollars because there are so many dollars. So we tend to pillar our value add around three aspects. The first is showing up with a prepared mind. Because the only thing we think about are things related to the movement of freight or the movement of people, supply chain or mobility, we can deep dive into areas, build networks, very quickly validate or disvalidate something. And we can then show up with you to actually talk about product, to talk about problems and opportunities in an informed way. The second area has to do with customers. And that also comes back to the first point, right? Because you want to do customer discovery, synthesize the feedback from customer discovery and customer conversations. But second pillar is around customers and being able to figure out access to small as well as large Fortune 500 type businesses. But equally, how does one kind of crack the nut, right? How do you actually get in? How do you prove value? How do you then convert that into a paying relationship? And then lastly, it's around talent. How do you sit back as you're clearly hitting product market fit and the best founders will realize, hey, actually my product now isn't my product. My product's my business, my company. And the features I need to manage are the key leaders and the talent that I do or don't have and working with them in order to succeed in, in that function. So that's where we'll lean in and really built into our process. If we don't feel like we can help, we won't make the investment. Just what's the point? There's a better investor out there for the entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's a match. Yeah. I was Go gonna ahead. say, I, I, no, I, I can just piggyback off it really quickly. I know we're uh, like getting close to time. Um, but yeah, I would agree with what, what Camille said, like investors early in, in your process, like while you're talking to them prior to their investment, uh, you know, that's a, a good indication of like who can be helpful, especially if you're building a relationship with someone over time uh, for, you know, for our series A and like, and now uh, people are, you know, starting to talk to us about series B, like, you know, talking to those investors and saying, you know, hey, like we really want connections to these new market segments. We really want uh, these are kind of like our target accounts right now. Like, do you have anybody you know there? Like, we'd love to talk to them. Or even just discovery calls. Like, it was a really interesting one for us too. Hey, we're thinking about this space and we really want to talk to experts in the space to see if like we have something there. Uh, for us as a software provider, it was like also really interesting. Um, and so thinking through like kind of like some of those aspects. And then another big one for us uh, has been connections to other founders. Uh, has been really interesting. Other founders that may be either uh, grappling with the same challenge at the same time or have already gone through some uh, some of those challenges. A uh, good example of this is uh, one of our investors connected us with the COO from Data IQ. 
And, you know, they went through a lot of similar pricing challenges that we were going through. And he was willing to sit down with us for an hour and talk about how he thought about pricing and how it evolved over the, t- the course of life for, for Data IQ. That was really powerful for us um, and gave us a lot of things to kind of chew on and think about uh, and make sure we're not just like sitting on our own kind of recreating the wheel. Uh, so that was really helpful. And then finally, I would say the third category that's been super helpful and kind of Santosh talk, talked about this at the very end, but thinking about our company as a product uh, and, and thinking about how do we structure our organization to be as successful as possible. So what anti-patterns have they seen in the past that haven't worked out or caused issues? Uh, what roles have they seen be super successful at various like inflection points in your company and various milestones? And how do they see uh, your organization growing over time so that you can kind of couch your understanding of how your organization grows and what they've seen? Because they've seen just a ton more companies, right? Like, so I think like that's one advantage for being a newer founder uh, is they've just seen it over and over again, right? So they're like, hey, hiring this role now probably isn't going to be successful because you don't have X, Y, Z. Like, that's like really good intel to have. So you don't burn a bunch of your runway hiring some people that you don't need early um, or, or vice versa, right? You know, like maybe you should make the investment uh, because you need to really step on the gas in some area. So, yeah. No, Austin, that's, that's super, um, super interesting. And it's so interesting to hear the different perspectives across the three of you, but also so many things that are like, you've said the same things in different ways. And it's really um, great to, to to have that information kind of come all together. Um, While well, I want to jump into QA, I did want to ask one more question. If you could all just like 10 to 15 seconds, um, uh, what advice might you want to, top advice you might want to share? And I'll start with you, Carolyn, and then Santosh and uh, Camille. And then we'll jump into QA from the, from the audience. I think my number one thing, and, and this maybe touches on, on Camille, kind of what you were saying about uh, just coming in as a, as a minority founder, uh, you know, even being like a female founder, like there's not a lot of investment in female founders. And I think like there's, it can't be understated that storytelling is a huge part of this exercise. Being confident in your story, understanding your value and what you bring to this sector and really understanding that why, why are you the one to solve this problem? And why is this space uh, good to solve right now? And I think like that, that was like the biggest, I think lesson learned that I had is like, and then the not all good or not all money is good money it is so, so true. If you get like, if you get on a VC call and in the first five minutes, you can pretty much tell whether or not they're either like anywhere in your stratosphere for understanding what you're building or, um, or if you're going to be able to work with them. And I think that's huge, like, cause they, it's a partnership and they're going to be around and be with you in the trenches when things are good or bad or everywhere in between. Um, so you got to be comfortable working with them and, uh, and, doing your due diligence on, on the opposite side too. Like get founder, get founder references of people they worked with. Um, make sure that you talk to some folks uh, in good and bad situations that have worked with that, that firm because like they are going to be there. And Tosh, and uh, I don't know, um, any advice you have? 20 seconds. Yeah, um, I think that point, that the last point that was made by Carolyn around founder references we will always offer references, but our assumption is that you will do off-list references and that we'll actually, our statement is you could call whoever you want on our portfolio page, find friends of friends that could speak to us uh, because equally we believe that our promises will hold true and people will speak uh, positively upon us. So we're not gonna try to hide anything. There's really nothing to hide. But it's a red flag equally when we don't think founders have done references, yeah. right? Like, are you like how would you treat then your employees yeah. and your hiring, right? So there, um, we've so far have not been in that position um, where we've had to say you didn't do references on us. What's up? Yeah. But uh, certainly, I think do that. And then around storytelling, reach into your network, right? Yeah. Um, in, in this network, find people who are VCs or are founders, ask them for 20 minutes, share your narrative, share your pitch with them. And that's how you iterate and you improve. Super okay, important. Cool. So we're gonna jump, cause I've, we've gone a little too far. I'm gonna jump in the uh, Q and A. And the first question is for uh, um, Camille, very specifically. Uh, this is from Ida Bird. Uh, you have a great, a sexy product as an EV charger. We are a mobility reskilling firm providing cybersecurity, networking, engineering, and diversity training. How do you get around racism and the doubt of the VC world in investing in Black women? By the way, we have revenue already. 
Like, I don't know how to get around racism, but <laughs> it kind of ties in. I was gonna share, I was gonna share <laughs> my little two cents and then I think it all ties together. I think um what what I had to do is just learn to trust myself. And that's like the advice that I would give to people is like you know, I'm from South Central Los Angeles. Nobody in my family has like raised rich. We don't got friends and family type of, you know, round money around here. So, but what I had to learn how to do is that there's certain things that with how I grew up, that is like a natural thing to me where you can just read people. And I think even with that, with like going out and raising money, not everybody is going to have a, a preconceived, you know, disposition towards you, but you trust your gut in that. And if you're on a call with somebody and it just don't feel right and it is just not with, you know what I mean? Don't do it. I almost made the mistake of taking capital for someone that I shouldn't have taken capital from, but I was scared, you know, but I think that if you really trust your gut and understand that like you can fail, it's not easy. It's going to be hard. You will have a lot of tears. You will doubt yourself often. But at the end of the day, if you just really trust yourself, like really work on that. I think that it helps takes you pretty far. Yeah, that's great. That, I mean, to your point, like you can't solve some of those bigger issues, but you can't let yourself also work just within that narrative. You have to write your own narrative. Um, so Natalie has a question. Thank you, Camille. Natalie has a question for uh, for Santosh. Uh, what is a standard reasonable amount of equity that a company should be prepared to exchange for the first round of funding? Funding. Um, let's start with that part. She has a two part question, but let's do that. So as you think about the stages of funding, usually most companies start with pre-seed. And at pre-seed, it's reasonable if you especially have a fund involved, a pre-seed fund, you're likely going to have dilution anywhere from 15 to 20%, not including an option pool, which should be added dilution. Um, and you can assume in this market right now, an option pool would add about 8 to 10% of dilution on top of that, right? And this is important to understand because if you assume that dilution is about constant round to round, then you want to roughly double the size of your fundraise because that's where you know that the pie is expanding where you're just as well off, right? As you continue on this path. And this is something founders don't often understand and they show up and they want to raise an outsized pre-seed. And what that does is sets the bar really high for your seed because you want to remain conscious of the dilution ultimately as a founder, but also with that uh, investor now who's joining the journey. Um, at seed, it's common to give 20 to 25%. I would say in this market, it's closer to 20. Um, and also there might be an option pool top up. But if you have an investor there, they're also going to share in the dilution of that top up. But investors have pro rata rights, right? So they can always maintain their equity position founders don't have that so be really thoughtful about that and ideally what you're doing is you're sizing the pool appropriately just enough and you actually have a plan as to as i go through my hiring this is what my um diligence shows i need to give away in terms of equity grants at series a you, you continue to be in that 20 to 25 percent range at series b is where you see the dilution starts to taper off a bit it's that transitory uh, stage. By Series C, you're talking about giveaways of 10 to 15%, and then it'll start to trend down in single digits. Thanks. Um, one, the next question from uh, Kim Hill, and I think this is best for Camille. Um, what avenues are there for a service provider nonprofit to raise money beyond foundation and public sector grants? I think that question is for you because you talked about these things. Oh yeah, I was actually just typing someone because someone was saying how much equity I gave up for the half a mil. And we actually didn't give up much of any equity. I had to do a 2% donation to someone. It's very interesting how they did that. But um, so a lot of the schools, so if you're, so for instance, MIT Solve, that's where we actually got at least $250,000 over two prizes and they call it prize money. So you, it's not earmarks with what you have to do with it. And so they put out these solve, um, I guess like competitions, at least three or four a quarter. And I don't think a lot of people know about it because 
<laughs> we, we've applied multiple times. We don't do it anymore because now it just feels bad. But if you go to MIT Solve, um, they're always putting out these like different prize competitions and it's for people that are trying to like solve these major, major pains of the world. Um, and the prize money sometimes anywhere between 100 and then and five hundred thousand um, dollars, and the competition isn't that crazy. Um, so I would do that. And then the other part um, is really pitch competitions. And to what Carolyn said earlier, like I talk to founders often because, like, that's one of the things I love, like chatting with founder fifteen minutes, which I put my LinkedIn. I could do that. I mean, y'all can reach out. It is getting your story together. I would talk to a founder and like they'll pitch me, and I'd be like, "But what do you do?" And then when they just talk to me regular, I'd be like, "Oh, well, why didn't you just say that?" So I think that whatever you do, whether you're a nonprofit or whatever, whatever, if you can get your story concise and together and compelling, you'd be surprised who is willing to give you some money. I was actually very surprised, uh, but I'll put my LinkedIn. But I'm happy to connect with people 15 minutes, and I can just hear your pitch, and I can let you know like. No, nah, I don't get it. Or like, yeah, like that, that should work. <laughs> Sorry, thanks, um, Camille. Uh, one more, another question for uh, Santosh. Um, and this one comes from Jeremy Bracken, who uh, wants to know, beyond the company's book value, how do you de determine the company's value when selling off an equity share of the company? So this might break your head, Jeremy, and, and others listening. Um, it has nothing to do with that. Um, there's there, like, you're talking about companies that are like amazingly nascent, right? Earliest of the early, even, even, even if they have revenue and some track record, it's probably not enough to base any future valuation estimate on. You can't do like a free cash flow on it. You certainly probably can't apply comps and look at the book value. So it's actually driven by what is right now the market norm at this stage amongst investors for the ownership they need. Because when a, an investor says ownership, you as a founder should say dilution, right? Two sides of the same token. Um, so in the current market at seed, right? It's the standard giveaway is 20%. Might be a little higher, might be a little lower, but around 20%. And uh, that would imply round sizes right now that you're seeing you know, from three to five million. It's crept up quite a bit in the last year. And the expectation then is that you're able to very clearly articulate. So it goes back to storytelling that we are a very credible team and this is why we're credible. We would use your funds and you can entrust us with that in order to do X, Y, and Z over 18 months. And this is what we should achieve into the next funding milestone. And it's up to the investor to figure out whether that uh, kind of is of merit and they subscribe to it where they want to be an investor and work with you to get to that next milestone, whether it's series A, series B, whatever. Can I add to that just super quick, James? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, and, and I think like this is another reason why it's so ha good to have advisors or be an accelerator or an incubator. So I'll be very transparent. I know people don't ever talk about what they're valued at, but so I got three different valuations. When we were going to take money from our first lead, they put our company valued at $4 million. The guy told so even though we are a software and service, we're at the hybrid, they told us you can only 1.5x that. They didn't understand my, they're also a Canadian investor. They didn't understand my industry. The next person that came to us, they said, oh, we could do six years, six million dollar valuation, right? And so I was, and for me, you know, I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to be worth too much because I don't want to down round, you know, and I'll take what I can give. You really think I'm six million? I got zero dollars right now, right? And so I was going to take that. And I went back to my advisors who are from the clean tech industry and they're like, like, no, like, let's lean in onto the software component. Let's lean into the industry. Let's lean into these things. And shift your story and then also make sure that my my financial model aligns because what you don't want to do is have a crazy valuation and then you can't meet up to that right we ended up with my that. it's always yeah like you know don't tell your valuation but like we ended up at an 11 million dollar valuation which feels very comfortable to us at a seed stage company because we were revenue we had revenue we have very large contracts we could have pushed for more but i didn't i didn't want to overshoot you know, what I thought we were capable of. And so like all of that to go to Santosh's point is that it doesn't, I feel like people go up, 
It's like, it depends on who you talk to, but then also having advisors to help you understand the value and then understand that having these crazy valuations isn't really helpful to you as a founder. You just want to have a fair and true evaluation for where you think you can really get to. Yep. Yeah, and and these and it's very tempting to look at the the you know plethora of news out there about these crazy rounds and be like, I want to raise a crazy round. But what that crazy round means is that your valuation is super super high, yeah. and like if you're raising thirty like a twenty million seed round or whatever, and your valuation is four x that, like that's going to mean you have to do a lot of work to get to your Series A. And like, and do you really think you can get there? And so I think that like, that's a huge thing to think about. So Eileen, and, and I think we got about one or two more questions. If you could give some experience on this one. Um, Eileen asked, and I'll start with you, Carolyn. Um, how, really, how do you learn about how this works? From Like how you go out, and, how do you learn about venture capitalism from a founder standpoint? Um, are there boot camps programs that, that, you, that helps you? Are you aware of any? And then Camille, the same question. Yeah, I knew nothing. <laughs> I had no idea what, what, what it meant to do fundraising. I had no idea what like a safe was. I had no idea what a price round was, any of this stuff. Uh, and I would say that, like, you know, one, talking to founders about it is really, really helpful. Just to have them walk you through an example uh, is, is very helpful. Two, um, Y Combinator actually has a lot of like of stuff written about this. They're a great resource. Um, so check them out. They have a ton of writing about just like, you know, your, you know, pre-seed stage, seed stage series, even series A, I think that I actually have a lot of content around now too. Um, and then finally, like, I, I also really like there's, um, so the, the investor I mentioned before, Alex Iskold, like has a, a blog too, uh, called like startup packs. He talks a lot about early stage companies. He actually came, he was a managing director at Techstars, So like that, is like helpful in that space too. But a lot of these accelerators actually have a lot of content around what these different fundraising things mean and like how you should think about it. Um, and then it's always helpful to get some founder experience and like talk to a few different founders that did some different approaches. Bootstrapped, VC, did a big, <laughs> skipped one around, like people skip rounds all the time too. Like, and they'll just go from like maybe seed to like whatever, or, or pre-seed to series A or something like that. So. Yeah. There's a lot of different paths. I think what Santosh said before is very valid. Camille, how, what, what about you? Any any ways you specific ways you learned about this or any uh, programs, boot camps? Yeah, so YC actually has a free summer program. I didn't get into YC, so good job, Carolyn. I didn't get into <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it's like a plan B. Um, it, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> but I said YC has a great summer school program that you can uh, get into. And then the other thing is Google, honey. I Google and YouTube Google. literally everything because there's some things people explain to me and I still wouldn't understand it. Like I'm the type of person I have to hear it multiple times and explain different ways. And so I would say like some of these terms go on YouTube, Google, and just see it in different ways. And also be okay if you don't first get it. I used to get so frustrated when people would try to explain to me like equity and valuations that it would make me really sad that I didn't understand it. But the more that I would Google and YouTube, and then also the book that Santosh said, Venture Deals, if you're a reader, you should be a reader. Y'all should be people. Y'all gotta start. Everybody needs to start reading more. If you're a reader, get you some books and just read it. And the more that you hear it and you're in these spaces, it's gonna click. But if it doesn't immediately click, do not be deterred. You know, like these things are just, it's a different world. You gotta give yourself time to get acclimated, but you can do it. Also, if an investor is not willing to explain to you how any part of their investment process works, you probably shouldn't work with them. Because like they should be willing to explain like the investment vehicle that they are you know, like attempting to use with you and like and what its implications are and you should be able to ask them a lot of very open and transparent questions. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, thanks to all the all the folks in the audience for giving questions. We went over a little bit. I do want to just really super quickly um, share a little bit about Michigan Central before we close. I'm gonna try to do this in two minutes or, or less. <laughs> Okay, so everyone should be able to see see my screen. Uh, so Michigan Central. So for those of you who don't know, who, those of you that aren't from Detroit, uh, Ford Motor Company in 2018 purchased the Michigan Central train station, which is one of the largest buildings in Detroit and uh, has been derelict for and vacant for 835 plus years. 
last train left it in 1980, uh, 85. And, and what we're trying to do is to turn it into a mobility, uh, the, the center of a mobility innovation district. Um, we believe it's a huge opportunity to, to lead the world in a wide range of issues, creating um, mobility and accessibility for, for both the community that is there, but also bringing new businesses and um, ideas and thinking to Detroit and solidifying Detroit as really the mobility capital of the world, the, the place that put the world on wheels and will continue to kind of catapult us into this new mobility um, world. So I'm just gonna flip through a couple slides just to show you the, the, the how big this is and how much stuff that is happening, um, just to get a context of why uh, we think it's really important to have these conversations and kind of facilitate um, this ecosystem as we build it here in Detroit. So it's really, um, consists of five buildings, or, or currently three buildings, and then two that are planned in the future. Um, the, the train station, um, the book depository building, which is uh, three million square feet of what's gonna be open maker space, and also a brand new parking uh, and mobility hub that will have some of the latest technologies that uh, that part of the, the mobility sector forward. And it's really a, a, a big endeavor that we're taking on to, to redefine the streetscape, but also redefine and revamp the way we work and how people will come to Detroit and see Detroit, but also see this industry, the, the automotive as it shifts into to mobility. Um, we're turning this old uh, platform uh, where you would get on the train into a uh, mobility platform where there'd be open testing from startups and new products and new solutions that you know you can for products or just witness what other companies are doing. And this will be kind of a constant churn of different things. Um, you'll see it, you see it in the left. And it's kind of a rendering of what it might be like. You could almost see it as a spectator, um, you know, the next drone or the next delivery robot, um, which is super exciting. But I think this, this slide here is, is something that I think is really important. Um, like this is, we're building this as a way to bring not, this is not just Ford Motor Company, it's really bringing everyone together um, across the industry to kind of create something bigger than what has been. And I know we're super out of time, so I'm gonna pass it back to, to Amanda to, to close us out. No worries, thank you, James. We can share that with everybody afterwards. Sure. Um, yeah. Big thank you to our speakers, Camille, Santosh, Carolyn. You all are so inspiring. This was such a great discussion. Um, and thank you for everybody for tuning in virtually and taking a break in the middle of your workday. We wish you all the same success fundraising and getting into accelerators and finding great grants and finding great partners like Santosh too. And, and James, thank you for sharing more about Michigan Central, you can go to the website to sign up for updates. And we'll be hosting our next event together in July. We're doing a spring, we're doing a quarterly show and tell where you can learn from other folks piloting new mobility technologies. So more great stuff coming. Um, and if anyone's ever heading to Detroit, uh, BMB would love to host you and say hello in person as we all exit maybe pan the pandemic here in the next couple of years. Um, so thanks everybody. We really appreciate you all. And we'll see you thanks, on. Thanks, James. James.